we'll give uh, folks a little over 30 plus seconds, uh, make their way into the session. Seems like it's been an exciting agenda so far. Folks uh, back to back um, from multiple sessions. Um, so I'm sure people are just ending one and joining another. So we'll give folks a few more minutes. Uh, Jessica, welcome. Thanks. Glad to be here. <laughs> Good. All right. <clears throat> I think we'll we'll get started. Uh, I think this is a appropriate time to do so. Uh, so again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Naveen Sharma. I'm the VP of Product, um, and I'm your moderator. I'll be hosting this particular session. The session topic is the decade of data engineers and data engineering. And I have an esteemed panel that join, joining me, and I wanted to make sure we give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. So, uh, Jessica, why don't you uh, take it away first? Um, yeah, so um, I started my career um, actually on the data science side of things. So um, I was like an analytics engineer. I did some um, environmental risk analysis for oil and gas. Um, okay. And then shortly after that, I realized that I just didn't really like doing analysis. And um, I really would prefer to um, build tools and support the people that, you know, are doing that analysis. And so um, about three or four years ago, I moved over to the data engineering side and I kind of haven't looked back. Um, I've, I've been really loving it. So that's great. Uh, I'm definitely have lots of follow-ups for you. I'll come back to you. <laughs> um, Evren, you want to go next? Sure. Uh, I'm the CTN, one of the founders of Stylo. I'm not a data engineer and we don't have a data engineering team. <laughs> Uh, but we work with lots of data engineers as uh, our goal is to help companies connect, uh, distribute data sources within their large enterprises. Uh, my background is I would call myself uh, more a software engineer and I have experience in graph technologies and semantics, knowledge representation. So coming it from a little bit more uh, from that angle, I'm very excited to be here at the panel. Great. Uh, Ash, you want to go next? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, hi, everyone. Um, really excited to be here and share my insight with you all. So I'm Ash Nasir, a Senior Director of Data Engineering at Warner Brothers Discovery. Uh, my team, um, you know, provides all the data, works with our product teams uh, that have all these different fantastic uh, applications like HBO Max and March Madness and Bleacher Report. Um, and we make sure that the uh, data science and analyst um, teams get the data that they need at the quality that they're expecting. Um, I've been I've been in this um, industry two decades. I mean, when we first started, it was, you know, it was all just sort of data warehouses and ETL. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like we've come a long way. Um, and, you know, data engineering, in my opinion, is more important than ever. And so excited to talk more about it and how it sort of goes really hand in hand with a successful data science program. Excellent. Thanks, Ash. And um, our last but not least uh, panelist, uh, Michael, thanks for joining. Uh, we're just going through a round of introductions. Uh, please awesome. could take 30 seconds to introduce yourself and your background. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Michael Sick. I am uh, first jealous of Jessica because I, I started out a geologist, geophysicist, never actually got to work in oil and gas, became an application <coughs> engineer and architect, and then just one day discovered uh, data out of the Lucene uh, project and uh, got very into Hadoop and thought I had mastered it all until I realized I didn't know the what fors or whys. I just knew, sort of knew the technology and I spent the last 10 years learning about uh, you know, data warehousing and sort of the formal data management of things. I serve as a, a director of data engineering and um, love the topic and glad to be here. Well, welcome, Michael. Thanks for uh, sharing your background. I do have to say that uh, <clears throat> all the panelists, including myself, uh, our commentary does not reflect the views or opinions of our respective organizations. I was told to make that uh, clear. Uh, so I've made I've done just that. So <laughs> with that, why don't we uh, why don't we get started, Jessica? Well, I'm going to lead off with you. Um, 
you 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 you, uh, you had a you have an interesting story there. You said you you started in data science, moved into data engineering, never looked back. Uh, how how what is what are what are the two how are the two roles distinct? Um, and then why did you make the comment you made that you never looked back? I'm curious. I want to learn more a bit more about that. Um, all right. So, uh, so I made the change, like I said, I wasn't totally happy. I wasn't really enjoying what I was doing. Um, how I like to think of the difference between, um, data science versus data engineering is, um, if you ask people the question, like, do you care what the data means? Right. I mean, obviously you should care, but like job wise, do you care what the data means? Um, right. If you don't necessarily need to know what the data means, um, that's more on the data engineering side of things. Uh, whereas data science is, you know, they're obsessed with what that data means, right? That's, you know, that is what they're doing all day long, every single day. And so um, I think one of the reasons I never looked back is, um, you know, data engineering, there's this crazy breadth of things to do, right? Um, you know, we mentioned like uh, the, there's the ETO, there's the data warehousing, but then, you know, there's so much more than that. There's stuff going on with graph neural networks that we need to support our, our data scientists in. Um, we have, you know, all these data privacy and data security implications. We now have GDPR, CCPA, all of these things. Um, we function as like, the infrastructure team just for our, our data team, right? Um, so I think the reason I never really looked back is um, I have severe ADHD and I love working on new things all the time. I get bored so easily and I don't think I've ever been bored in a data engineering role. Um, I'm working on a different thing every single day and um, it's move, it moves so fast that I feel like I'm always trying to catch up. I'm always like diving in and learning new things. Um, and yeah, that's that's what keeps me going. Cool. Um, it's interesting, uh, just to follow up there. Um, are you, is the team, they're centralized. You typically feel that's the right model, or, or, or the team should be organized by business functions and have a data engineering team within those functions. Uh, you have a point point of view on that? Uh, I think that I don't know. I think that there's no real like one answer to this question. I think that um, you know, in my my short time in the data space, I feel like I've seen the industry kind of. Um, change to one and then go, oh, wait, hold on. There's no such thing as free lunch. What are you talking about? There's drawbacks to this too, right? Yeah, sure. um, Yeah, I think it just really depends. I think that, um, I don't think that you're ever going to be able to move away from having some sort of a centralized team that kind of owns certain functions. Right. Um, but I think when you start to think about like those data modeling aspects and those things that, um, you know, might might belong more on like a, a knowledge engineer or something like that, and not necessarily somebody that um, I would necessarily consider as a data engineer. I think people like that definitely should be embedded in those teams. They know the data way better than anybody else. Right. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't. I think that yeah. a hybrid model maybe is the, what makes sense, but I think it really just depends on the organization. It depends is a perfect perfect answer. <laughs> hybrid model, absolutely. I think um, you're right. Uh, it, Organizations go back and forth, um, ultimately um, gravitating towards the middle, right? Uh, the, the answer always lies somewhere in the middle, as they say. Ash, um, how about you? What, what distinguishes a data engineer versus a data scientist? And are those clearly demar you know, roles defined inside of your organization? Um, yeah, so let me sort of share a little bit of a history. I, I feel like if we're talking about the 2020s being the decade of the data engineer, uh, the 2010s were clearly dubbed as the decade of the data scientist, right? Uh, and organizations, you know, 10 plus years ago realized that, hey, you know, data science is such a critical function. It'll help us unlock a lot of value in the organization and help us do a lot of interesting things that we couldn't do. We really need all these data scientists. However, what they didn't realize is a big part of a successful data science program is to make sure that the data is there, the data is clean, it's, you know, timely, and just, you know, getting the right data, you know, acquiring it and managing it uh, was, was a big piece of the pie. 
And they started hiring a lot of these data scientists, which, you know, as Jessica mentioned, I mean, we, we all sort of have, uh, you know, hybrid skills there. You know, if you're a data science, you know, you know, you know how to acquire data and build pipelines and so forth. But what happened was uh, a lot of people uh, who did want to do anal ana analytics and analysis and core data science uh, things like building all these cool models and things like that, they joined an organization and they realized, well, you know, 70 to 80 percent of their job was actually acquiring the data. Right. Um, and so that that was a mismatch. And that's where, you know, if you've heard a lot of the stories about, uh, you know, people leaving data science roles, even sometimes in less than a year and sort of jumping ship. And why do data scientists not sort of want to stay in one place? It's really the um, you know, I, I think in the last 10 years, um, it, it was sort of, um, you know, the lack of recognition that there is more to data science uh, and sort of getting the data was really important. And I really feel like the past few years, we've turned the corner where, we, where we've where we realized that, hey, it's a different personality. Just like Jessica said, right? You know, she actually enjoys data engineering. I, I do too. Uh, well, you know, I, I have fun on both sides of the house, right? But, um, you know, it's really important to recognize because the work's there. So rather than having one person sort of do something that they're not like 70% of their job that they're not interested in. The focus on each of those um, areas, uh, I'm really glad that we as an industry are sort of recognizing the role of the data engineer, which is as important as the data scientist. Cool. Yeah, I, I, maybe I'll just jump in because I mean, that right resonates very uh, well with me what you are saying, but I think there's also a long way to go in the industry. I just, there was a poll earlier in the keynote this morning asking the data scientists uh, at the conference, uh, where do you spend most of your time? And I think the answer was still that 90, 95% collection of data and cleansing data. So I think as uh, industry appreciates more the role of data engineering, that's why we are seeing so much interest in that area and recognition because it's still an ongoing problem. <laughs> Well, that's that's great, Evan. Good good feedback from uh, from the poll earlier, um, Michael. Uh, just to build yeah. on that, if you were giving uh, early in career advice, which I've just seen a bunch of questions come up, the question is, where sh should I focus more on data engineering or data science? What should I learn first? What would your answer be? I I think the panelists have stated it indirectly, in that it is a it is a personality type. I view the two roles. There's a lot of common skills between them necessary to do the job. Um, one of those is data wrangling. And if you kind of view the skill sets as a Venn diagram, I, I would I would take the personality test. If you're data wrangling and you view that as pregame and you're excited to formalize what you're doing and that and, and that gets you excited, then, then work on being a data engineer. If uh, if you are uh, annoyed by doing that then, uh, you know, but want to work with, uh, you know, the end model and answer the business question, become a data scientist. Cool. That's great advice. Uh, hopefully uh, the individual that asked that question uh, listens to what you have to say. Certainly that's where a lot of the action seems to be these days. Um, in, in as everyone stated, like the data wrangling itself. So, so Jessica, what, what are the skills that make for a good data engineer uh, in your mind? Just, just what Michael said in terms of beyond the personality test, um, what would you what would you say uh, will make up good good skills for a data engineer? Um, so I think this first one is kind of in between personality and skills. Um, I would say if you're kind of somebody who's always been like a jack of all trades person, data engineering is a, probably a really good fit for you. Um, like I mentioned, it's just this really crazy breadth of responsibilities. Um, and so if you're somebody who's like just really comfortable, like, you know, not necessarily being the expert in like one thing, but, you know, kind of having this um, this breadth of like semi expertise. Um, other than that, like um, skill wise, you know, um, some some pretty good fundamentals in computing. I think you need um, a little bit more solid of like a computer science background for um, data engineering, whereas like data science, I would say, um, I usually recommend that to like my mathier people. Um, just, you know, you're doing a lot more math. I very rarely have to do math as a data engineer. 
Um, and then, uh, and then I think also on that personality test thing, and I don't know how true this would be for data scientists, but um, one thing that I love about being a data engineer is that um, I am a super social person. I am very, very driven by the relationships I have with my colleagues. And as a data engineer, my primary, um, my primary customers are the people that I work really closely with um, internally and not necessarily externally. And so um, that really drives me to get my work done, right? I'm making my coworkers' lives better. I deeply care about them. Like that is what gets me to work every single day, right? Cool. Cool. Yeah. Evren, your perspective, obviously you don't have a data engineering team, but we work uh, from a startup perspective, with a lot of data engineers. Uh, in your experience, what, what makes for good skills for, for data engineer roles? Yeah, I think a lot of skills that you use for software development are, are useful. Software engineering are useful in the data engineering context as well. Like very basic things, version control, automated testing, continuous integration, uh, modularity and reuse. Because we see teams struggle like when you have data engineers doing a lot of manual processes and things. It's not repeatable. It's not testable. And having that kind of automation, just like you would have for your software, is uh, crucial in the data engineering pipelines as well. Uh, so, um, yeah, I would highlight that. How about you, Mike? What What are your thoughts on uh, good skills for a data engineer? Uh, I, you know, SQL, 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 um, you know, right. at, at the heart of things, right? And understanding that, and I think it it helps to have the computer science background to understand, you know, SQL from the relational math perspective that kind of eliminates a lot of mysteries of, of what you're doing uh, uh, in that. Uh, past that, I think really good software development skills, just, you know, you need to, to, to automate um, to and and to have a, a an environment that that works well without a lot of errors or a lot of calls for you late at night, you have to follow good software practices. And um, I, and I think without that, you can build a lot of pipelines. They will eventually bury you, and you'll be you'll be doing nothing but like responding to issues about them instead of actually bringing in new data and produce, producing new analytics. It sounds like you were uh, you were in my uh, talk uh, an hour before this. <laughs> exactly the challenges you want to avoid, right? Is is the amount of complex ETL pipeline pipeline development in general. Repeatability is important. Just following good software development life cycle practices, uh, all ap applicable uh, within this domain. Um, good, Ash. Um, you know, certainly the challenge around volume and diversity of data is is, is just compounding uh, with the advent of cloud and the shift to the cloud, multi-cloud, hybrid, uh, as you well know. So the ability to handle and move that much more data uh, is becoming a big data engineering problem. And what, are, what are some of the challenges that you, you're facing in your role that you can share with this, uh, with this group? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I feel like um, I feel like we're we're in the golden age of data, um, and not just from a volume and variety and complexity of of data, right? Uh, in terms of all the tools and technologies that are at our disposal, I, I almost feel like we have more than we need, in my opinion, um, because you know a lot of you know great technology companies realize that you know, uh, data and sort of data management and data engineering is a underserved area, um, you know, in, in the technology world. And so uh, there's a lot of investment from the technology uh, world, both in terms of, you know, open source as well as commercial products that are out there. So I sort of feel like one of the challenges that I have is sort of keeping up with all the tools and technologies that I uh, that, that are out there, all the new sort of uh, techniques and methods of sort of bringing data in, how to handle data at scale, because when you're talking about, you know, trillions of uh, data points and, you know, uh, you know, terabytes, even petabytes of data, even a small swing at that, at that scale 
has a huge impact in terms of the kind of compute you use and the kind of uh, you know costs that you are driving for your organization. So I think that's a big one in terms of how do you select the right tool. And I think there's a set, there's a different angle to that as well. Is it's not just sort of how do you sort of uh, you know select the right tool for the right job. It's also getting my data engineers to agree on which is the best approach. And, and you know the reality is, uh, you know, none of the approach like I, uh, there's rarely an approach which I feel like is a bad approach, right? I mean, in terms of, you know, every problem has, uh, you know, uh, multiple different kinds of solutions. But you know, having my engineering team sort of agree on how we should do things a certain way, sort of developing those patterns, uh, that is again, you know, goes back to their individual preferences, their backgrounds, and so forth. So getting them all to agree and sort of come up with the patterns, I think that's another big one. Because really, at the end of the day, I feel like in this industry, it's really important to make make your team members happy at their work, what they're doing and engaged at what they're doing. So just making sure that uh, they feel like, you know, they're an important part of the solution. Uh, that's a big one as well. Got it. Okay. That's interesting. Um, I think about this problem, <clears throat> or we generally think about this problem from a data producer standpoint. And um, I, I think one of the, the in, in the past couple of years, you know, the mindset has shifted towards data consumers. And so Evan, from your point of view, I, I, I know Stardog obviously plays well with this, with this, this data consumer first approach. How do you see this problem of volume and variety and, and the complexity in the data landscape sort of addressing that shift? away from the producers uh, and, and more towards the consumers? Yeah, I mean, as you say, data production has traditional focused on kind of vertical silos to solve a specific problem. You build a database, the data goes in there, and every kind of departmental unit might have their own databases. But then you, have, you need horizontal access to that data, the white data that connects all these different pieces that comes together. And that's a big challenge we see in our customers who are dealing with tens and some uh, tens of thousands of databases spread around. And the consumer needs to access the data wherever it might be stored. And then uh, the data being very tightly coupled with its storage layout makes it hard. And that's why we see kind of a semantic layer playing a role because. You are trying to build a customer 360 solution, and nobody in the company can agree what a customer is, right? <laughs> which is a strange thing, but that's really when the complexity of the real world comes in. That's the case. So how do you make the connections between those data sources so that you can pull them together and give it to a data scientist or an analyst to gain additional insights? And that's where, uh, yeah, the the right and the distribution, especially as you said, in a hybrid cloud setting becomes a big challenge. Got it, cool. So, so if I think about then those from a, from a challenge perspective, um, obviously the industry is starting to evolve um, the data space in general, right? The data lakes, the lake houses, um, there's a lot of talk around enterprise data fabric, data fabric architectures, data mesh patterns uh, in enabling the consumers to essentially you know, be more independent, right? This notion of data democratization through these through, through the new deployment architectures. Uh, Jessica, starting with you, what what are you seeing the you know, from an, not just this broader industry adoption, but just from your own experience, uh, resonating inside of your own organization in general, but, uh, you know, where, where are you kind of seeing that shift in the industry? Uh, where, where are people gravitating towards the most? Um, yeah, so I think that this is a really interesting um, space right now. Um, I feel kind of like, Ash, how you mentioned, you're like, I can't keep track of all the tools. There's so many tools. I can't keep track of the terms. There's so many terms, right? <laughs> I don't know what data fabric, data mesh, right? Like there's just, I feel like every week I, I get busy with my 
my work that I'm doing. And all of a sudden I'm like 10 years behind on whatever's going on in data engineering. Um, so one thing I'm really excited about um, that I've been kind of digging into a little bit lately is um, just the widespread use of iceberg, right? How that's being adopted by some of the, um, some of the more like uh, full cloud providers, like for example, Snowflake announcing um, iceberg support. So I'm really excited about the idea of, you know, shared data between, um, you know, maybe you have like an enterprise team and you have like a product team, right? And you don't want to be working off like multiple sources of truth. So being able to have, you know, your like Presto query engine running on iceberg tables, but also have something that's just out of the box that just works and supports, you know, maybe some of your more business customers like Snowflake also working off that same source of data and being able to join that back to data within like the Snowflake database or, um, you know, I think I want to say maybe Databricks even also, I could totally be wrong here, but um, there's like growing support for that. And so I don't know, I think that's really powerful um, to allow, you know, these different people to work together, but not be introducing yet another definition of what a customer is, right? Michael, yeah. from your perspective, um, no, that's, that, that's great because I'll, it's interesting you say that because the, 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 you started with this notion of data warehousing is where it's at, um, sort of evolving to data lakes, well, data warehousing were purpose-built, data lakes were purpose-built. Now this uh, evolving architecture around lake houses, um, and then even more broadly, sort of architectural patterns that you know look beyond just storing data or computing. You, you got a cataloging aspects. You know the notion of a knowledge graph that sits within this data fabric. Um, Michael, what are, what are you seeing from a, both from an industry perspective, but just from your own experience within your organization, sort of? Uh, approaches that that are resonating or are actually creating value uh, inside of your organization. I I feel like uh, a lot of times with these, you know, with these terms, their progressions. Uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, from one thing to the next. Uh, sometimes I feel like you know if you're moving from a data lake to a lake house and kind of adjusting your spend on on your data warehouse. Um, there's, there's a temptation to kind of just forget the old thing that you were working on or not account for it. And I, and I think that organizations have to pay attention and, um, you know, f finish out the old job as they, as they bring the new one, because with each new term that kind of comes and I'll see it in an article, I start a mental countdown on my head, and, you know, uh, from that moment that, you know, the CEO or, or CEO that I'm working with at the time, like between when does it reach their press and when will they come and ask why we don't have one? Uh, <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and then the second question inevitably is, is you know, what is it and, and how can it help us? But they really seem to want one before, um, uh, before they get to all that. Uh, I think data, like, you know, I think data fabric is great. Um, I think that we talked earlier about having a computer science background and keeping certain things in mind. I, you know, so I think when those types of things come along, you, you need to be able to evolve standards and a practical approach in your organization that says, well, we can use data fabric for this, but say, if we're trying to do data fabric uh, and, and join things into distributed databases and we're joining big table to big table, right? Like you can't fight the speed of light. Right. Things have to connect over a network to talk with each other and you're going to inevitably get bad results. So you have to give people guidance um, about what is possible and what is not possible and, and, and sort of expected results. Right. Well, which makes sense, right? I mean, ultimately uh, you, you can't defy physics as you say. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and then of course, you're, again, you're a lot of that also you come in and you know, you're, you're vendors, and, you know, I think it just always behooves you to have like a couple of use cases handy in your pocket and say, okay, well, I've got, you know, this billion row table and I have this, you know, like several billion row table and I want to join them. Okay, great. And they'll kind of start to bluff through and then, you know, you ask them to, you know, order them and pick the top five where the criteria sits on both sides. And, and 
you know that's impossible <laughs> to do it <laughs> in a timely fashion. Right. Right. You have you, so sometimes I think you have to you have to show where yeah, just where things work, where things don't. It doesn't a new tool or a new approach doesn't have to answer. It's not everything. gonna solve everything, correct. Yeah. No, just agree. don't shoot yourself in the foot in front of your 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 client or or uh, you know, customers. Ash, your thoughts? Um I do agree there's a whole lot of um, you know, approaches uh in the industry and you know, every few years uh there is a new one. Uh, it is because I, I really believe, like, if you think about, you know, 10, 20 years ago, it was all sort of thought of a monolith, right? Everyone thought that there was one approach um, to sort of managing data in your organization and all organizations were uh, created equal. Well, I'll share something which a lot of organizations um, don't go through that my company goes through. And we're talking about um, the notion of how do you define a customer um, right. for us? It's impossible for us to def have one definition of a customer because right. if you talk to, uh, you know, uh, one business unit who sort of launches the movie, think about the the Batman movie that we launched this year, right? So, you know, uh, they're focused on how do we how do we make sure that people really go to theaters and watch that movie and become successful. Uh, but then uh, there's another group. Uh, once it goes on HBO Max from a streaming perspective, there's another group that really cares about people tuning in and signing up for HBO Max and making sure that that movie is successful on HBO Max. Yet there is another group that thinks about, oh, how do we sort of make sure that our all the distribution channels like, you know, buying it on you know, Amazon Fire TV or Apple TV or whatever, you know, if you want to buy that movie and watch it uh, on demand, you know, how is that successful? And yet there's another group that says, okay, you know, maybe when, you know, after the windowing process, uh, that movie sort of goes and, you know, uh, gets played on, on uh, different cable TV channels, right? And so cable TV channels and even partner services, uh, streaming services and so forth and so on. How do we make sure that's successful? So a customer is, is, you know, at the end of the day, it's still an individual, but the way they consume it is different and the customer at the end of the day is different. Um, so for us, it's a, it's a, uh, it's something that we have even inherently, uh, you know, built in our data. Uh, I would call it more of a data mesh, but you know, people would argue it's a hybrid between a mesh and a fabric. But my sure. point, uh, the, the, uh, the key that we uh, follow is the fact that we let the teams the product teams um, sort of own their data domains. Um, mm -hmm. And we really sort of federate that um, sort of those definitions and that data in those, those different, uh, uh, you know, functions. However, you know, we have the tools and the process and the governance in place at an organizational level to make sure that it all sort of works together, right? So, you know, as an example, uh, you know, back to my example of a movie being launched, you know, uh, for the company at some point in time, you would want to know, okay, how well does it do in theaters versus a streaming service versus, you know, on cable TV and so forth and so on to determine how, you know, the next uh, set of movies need to be marketed and, you know, um, uh, you promoted and sort of shared with different platforms, right? So uh, at the end of the day, you do need a bigger picture, but, you know, sometimes it is really beneficial for each sort of product team to be sort of, uh, uh, you know, focusing on, on, on their domain. And that's the sort of the federated model that we have in our company. And we're happy with it. We don't, you know, uh, we do have centralized uh, teams. I'm, I'm part of the centralized team that helps a lot of these uh, groups, but we we've never sort of forced a centralized vision on uh, on the broader organization. Got it. Which makes yeah, sense. I mean, yeah, everyone yeah, going to ask say, you, that's a, yeah, that's a good pivot towards, a, you know, just the idea of federated approaches, right? Uh, what, yeah, what definitely. I mean, that's kind of the, where data mesh is coming from, that federation and not forcing everybody to agree on one uh, definition of customer, but still enabling all these people dealing with the similar data to work with each other. Sometimes we use the term cooperation without coordination. Like you don't need to coordinate on all to agree on a single definition, but you still need to cooperate with each other so you can exchange data and interoperability and federation becomes a key uh, uh, concepts there because otherwise you are trying to boil the ocean and trying to make everyone agree on one definition where their 
day-to-day -day business needs doesn't actually uh, satisfy with that kind of forced single definition. Which is which is goes back to the rigidity, right? So the rigidity is sort of ingrained in how you model, um, and that model modeling is based on you know a, a particular application in mind, but that may not lend itself from a reusability standpoint or sharing standpoint or interoperability standpoint. You know, let alone within the organization, within the enterprise, but also, you know, as you're trying to partner across an ecosystem of industry, you know, within an industry across organizations, uh, you may find that to be a challenge. So, um, yeah, that, that the idea of one definition, one view uh, somehow gives me shivers when I hear that, that that's, <laughs> you can never get, I mean, that's where, that's where friction gets added. That's where, you find a lot of these data projects end up failing because of the, the politics of it, right? Um, so I so said some sort of a federated approach where there is some independence and some, some ability to slice the data with the lens that's uh, critical to that business unit or that use case, um, you know, shaping the model uh, the way you want to consume it rather than uh, having to worry about how it's structured and shaped uh, based on where the data is stored, right? That That's always a challenge. Um, so uh, obviously we kind of went through this this round of, you know, what's what's working? Uh, what do you continue to see? It's just a lot of shiny new toys. Um, just Michael, from your perspective, maybe starting off like over the next year and beyond, like what do you see um, from your perspective that excites you in terms of new innovations in, in the field of data engineering? So I think we, we talked about them a bit. I think the, um, the table formats that Jessica was talking about, you know, from Hootie to, to, to Delta to Iceberg are okay. going to be awesome. Hopefully what we'll, I like, I'm hoping we're going to see either convergence or some interoperability there because they largely do the same things and there's a okay. little bit of difference, but there's a ton of overlap uh, in them. And I think they're they're a great move forward and allow us to move more things, make that sort of lake house uh, work uh, reasonably. Just being able to do updates and inserts is is huge. Um, I think we'll continue to see the trend of you know there there are specialized databases, but sort of a strong SQL in the center approach uh, seems to have been the the story of the last few years, and I and I see that continuing. And then uh, personally for me, I think uh, uh, better modeling and automation based on like the metadata associated with modeling. You know, we've been looking at uh, Data Vault as, as modeling technique and some of the tools that are associated with that that support automation sort of on a, an entity or, or a more data oriented level than just I'm automating, you know, how I bring up or bring down my my um, data pipelines, but more, um, you know, sort of about the entities and domains themselves. I think that's sort of our next opportunity to get called less on the weekend and be able to move faster and just data more. So. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, you say that, Evren, um, again, just the idea, notion of entities and domains and modeling sort of abstracted away from, you know, having it deeply embedded in, you uh, the data pipelines or, or frankly, the data storage infrastructure. Um, I'm just curious, what do you, what do you think um, from an innovation standpoint, uh, you know, what's exciting in the next year or so? Yeah, I mean, obviously I have a biased point of view here, uh, probably, but I see semantics playing more and more role and not just saying it as like our offering, but you see in the uh, industry like DBT of recent introducing a semantic layer of their own. You see the need for that kind of contextualizing the data so that uh, you can make sense of the data easier. You can uh, connect to other relevant data sources. I think we'll see more and more use of that, like uh, importance of metadata in addition to data, like semantics is very uh, tightly coupled with metadata. What is this data about? How can I use it? 
uh, I think we'll see that taking more and more mainstream usage. Great. I think we're at the end of our allotted hour. Uh, this has been a great discussion. Uh, hopefully the uh, the audience here uh, found that uh, from this discussion fruitful. Certainly uh, lots to learn in the field of data engineering. Uh, this, as the title says, it's been the decade of data engineering and sort of this evolution continues. New technologies are coming fast uh, and furious. Uh, let's try to avoid the new shiny toy syndrome, as uh, Michael said, and uh, you know certainly, you know, bring the use cases um, that uh, to the forefront, and uh, you know prove out prove out the value, and that that's the way to go. So, try to really nice. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for everyone's time. Everyone, Jessica, Michael, Ash, uh, good chatting with you guys. So, take care. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Take care. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.